Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get you introduced and we can get you started. Um, my name is Lori Petrie, and I am one of the adult services um, persons here at the library. And the library is, is um, proud to present this program tonight. Um, and today we have Shirley. Everyone should know Shirley in town, but if you don't, Shirley is going to talk to us. And um, I'm going to let her go ahead and introduce her program and get it started. So um, if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the Q&A at, at, on the bottom of your screen. And I will go ahead and ask those questions to Shirley. And if you have any um, technical issues you're having if any trouble with that I might be able to help you as a library representative, go ahead and put it in the chat. And I'll do my best to kind of answer those questions. And do you want to take it away, Shirley? Hey, thank you. Well, welcome to the History of Marshfield Exhibition Preview. Um, our concept um, for the, for the um, exhibition is traveling through the streets of time. Now, first of all, I want to thank my grandson, Justin, because he has taken all of the pictures and, and done a lot of technical things for me. So I, I really want to thank him. So um, this exhibition has taken quite, quite some time. Uh, we started um, after um, the library was done and the library and the Parks and Recreation cleared out the site for us um, so that we could work. Um, then I had to take um, um, a blank uh, plan and set many, many hours uh, measuring out um, spaces for each of our exhibits. And so, which took a lot of time. So um, we'll get started then. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is um, our log cabin. Get that up here. We're just gonna share the screen. So we gotta get that up first. I don't know why it's closed. All right. What's over here? Oh, there we go. So they haven't seen it yet. I got to oh, share okay. the screen first. Are we ready? We are ready. So go All ahead. Right. All right. There's our, our log cabin. Now, what we did, we had a postcard of what the first log cabin looked like. And actually, it's not a cabin. It was built as a railroad hotel. And so um, we, um, we wanted to make it as, as authentic as possible. So those are actually logs. Um, that the cabin is, um, or the uh, hotel is built up. So we go to the next one then. And there we have a little sign that talks about the beginnings and what was here before, before there was, was no Marshfield. All right, next Oops. we go inside. Over there, okay. All right, and you will find on the inside, um, we have a description of what was in the inside. Um, on the one side, there was a pot bellied stove, and then you can see a table um, with um, benches uh, where, where the um, log, people that came to stay lodged, and um, Mrs. Rivers would cook their meals for them. And then we go um, to, um, and you will see a shelf there and the end. And um, so Louis Rivers also had a store there. So you could purchase items uh, from the store. And then on the other side, we have, um, as you can see the other side, and then we have a dry sink where um, that denotes the kitchen that was there and uh, the water bucket. And he had also, uh, so we have all kinds of utensils there that you can see. And we had the, the lighting that would be, for instance, like in a cabin. So then on, as you can see, we have a hanging lanterns 
And then also there's the bunks, which um, where the um, where the lodgers would stay. Now they're they were not very. These are of course are not, are not very large, but I understand that bunks like this were not large. That um, the uh, the lot uh, the person that was sleeping there would kind of roll up in a ball, and that would be his sleeping place. And also you see. Over the doorway, we have um, authentic rifle uh, on deer horns. So now next we go to early lumbering. Now here in the, in the foreground, you will see a rocking chair. That rocking chair was given to us um, by um, the town of McMillan. They had saved B.F. McMillan's rocking chair all of these years, so they asked us to, to display it. So I incorporated this into the early lumbering because B.F. <clears throat> excuse me, B.F. McMillan came here in 1874 um, and logging. <clears throat> then I also talk about Ada, his wife, because she was a very lovely, gracious, um, caring woman. And so we tell a little about uh, Ada. And then of course, B.F. McMillan was known as the area's first millionaire. Then we go to a foundation of a city. And this, of course, um, tells the story of um, William Upham. William Upham and Mary, his wife, and their little adopted daughter, Carrie, came to Marshfield in 1878. Now, um, Mr. Uh, Upham, uh, William Upham was a man of foresight and leadership. And so he actually, after he built the uh, uh, sawmill and a store that he kept building and building. And eventually, um, and you have to read the whole story, uh, he um, went and he bought an electric light system so that Marshfield uh, had the, Marshfield was the first, third city in the state of Wisconsin to have electric lights. Um, Appleton was first, um, Oshkosh, and then would you believe Nielsville was second because of the rivers there, the um, Black River there, and then Marshfield was the third. But he went out east and bartered for uh, and brought back um, and had shipped here uh, machinery. So in 1885, um, uh, we had electric lights in Marshfield. Then, of course, um, we have this tragic um, Marshfield fire. And um, then after that, of course, um, because of his leadership again in foresight, he was elected governor in 1895. Then we have also a scene here um, from, and we talk about Mary Upham. And, and she was a wonderful woman and she did many wonderful things for the city of Marshfield. She was also a doctor. And so we have a doctor's uh, case here. Now, also, it came into our possession, um, a, a fireplace screen that was Bob Mikowski's. Where he got it, we have no idea. But anyway, um, so what um, Mike did, now I have to explain also, Mike Fire has done all of the construction. Now he's had some volunteers, but he has actually done all the construction in our museum. And so he's a master. So he went over to the mansion, took a picture and he replicated this fireplace. So you will see that here. And you see it here close up. And you will also see the chair there with books um, because um, um, 500 books came from Massachusetts and um, Mary Upham started the first library but you will learn all about that if you come and see it. And then this also was given to us, um, a bronze plaque that at one time, um, obviously must have sat in the Upham yard, but was taken out. And so it was given to us after it sat many years. And so we cleaned it up and it's on display. 
Then we go to St. Joseph's Hospital, 1890. And then we tell the story of the hospital. And you will see there an authentic um, um, wheelchair from that period. And um, so we tell the story of, of the hospital. And that shows a picture of the early hospital um, that was um, built, but of course it's, it's gone now, but it's on the front of their, one of their magazines. So we thought that was a good representation of, of what people would, would look at and, and remember the hospital there. Now, so this is uh, depicts St. Joseph's School of Nursing. Um, the St. Joe's School of Nursing, um, graduates asked us if we, they could have a place in the museum for their artifacts. So we told them, yes, that they could. And so this is theirs. Um, and you will see there, um, there's a rotating, um, rotating um, stand, and they have looked up every single graduate of the School of Nursing and they have their pictures there. Then also they have um, their books, their memorabilia, um, um, some of the capes and uniforms. And you'll see they have some stained glass. And then we have also a, a picture of an oil painting that was done. Um, so they have a very lovely display there. Now we go to the schools. And so we tell the story of every school in Marshfield. And then um, in the foreground, you will see, um, I, I thought that we should have, we should show people what an old fashioned playground was like because today um, kids don't have the opportunity of having uh, a merry-go-round like this. And actually that merry-go-round goes around and the teeter-totter. So then we have a um, little mannequin there. And in the background, we have a blackboard. And on the blackboard, somebody has been naughty and they've had to um, write many times uh, that they will not do it, whatever they did again. Then um, also we have a desk. But on the desk, you will see um, a gong. That gong is from McKinley High School that was used to um, uh, signify the changing of classes. And up on the wall, we have a, um, a model of the high school that was built in 1939-40. And that, was, um, that model was made by Matt Zettler. And so we had a permanent place for that now. So that shows. Next we go, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Great Marshfield Fire. Now you can see here the panorama of the, um, the, the, um, the model. There's two models here. The model before the Great Marshfield Fire and after the Great Marshfield Fire. Now this is historically accurate because we took it off the Sanborn fire maps. So we knew where every house was, whether it was a two story, a um, half, um, one story, whether it was log cabin, whether it was stone house, no matter what it was. And then in the background on the right hand side, you will see um, the Upham Yard there. And um, so, and people have said, uh, when I first came to Marshfield, people said, well, the streets in Marshfield downtown were only 60 feet wide before the fire. But after the fire, they made them 100 feet wide. That is not true. They have always, they were always 100 feet wide because the Sanborn fire maps show them as such. And this shows a little more close up of that. And then we have the depiction of what the town looked like after the Great Marshfield Fire, how the whole center of the city was gutted. And so unless you see it visually, you have no idea 
the effects of that fire. Now we go to the railroads. Now, uh, Keith Meacham, who is our local railroad expert, um, did this. Um, he and Mike put this together. Well, we all had a hand in it. But those two signs at the top, uh, they actually came off of the depots in Marshfield. And Keith had um, rescued those. And so um, they are now um, <laughs> hanging in our museum. And then on the right-hand side, you will see a railroad desk. And that was given to us by Dan Schmidt, and it is from the 1800s. Then uh, there's many, many um, railroad pictures. Now, here we have um, preserved. Um, this, these um, plaques came off the 2442. Now, way back when we started to, to um, talk about restoring the 2442, um, Keith took those off of the engine and he brought them and I hid them <laughs> so that they would be safe because he said, <clears throat> if they stayed on the engine, that they would certainly be stolen and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and they were worth a lot of money. So we have them well anchored um, on that piece of board, but also on the wall. Then here also you see uh, Keith also made, uh, this is a, an authentic replica of the roundhouse, which was by um, where Cedar Rail is now. And then there's a roundhouse and you can see the train on the, on the uh, going around on the, um, on the turntable, I'm sorry, on the turntable. And then on the wall, you can see we have the, the um, story of, a restoration of the 2442. And that was spearheaded, of course, by Stan Custer and our beloved Stan. And then you can see on the wall also, we can see um, maps, railroad maps that were given to us by the city of Marshfield. And uh, you can see the little scenes that, that uh, Keith has done. Now here we go, we have, we feature three early Marshfield businesses. And the first one, as you see, um, there is Hans Billy. Now Hans Billy um, came to this country from Denmark, but he, and he was a builder and he was um, also an architect. I did not know this until I started studying Hans Billy. And he also, he built my house that I live in and a number of houses, prominent houses here in Marshfield. And we have his collection of his tools. And you'll see that little rocking chair there. That was made for, by him for his granddaughters, um, Anne and Elizabeth Adler. So Betty and Ann Adler. Um, so those were... Then we have um, with the story of Rem's funeral home. They are actually the oldest builder or the oldest um, business in Marshfield. And they were 1893, but they of course are still in operation, but not in the state. They've had several locations. And then on the other side, we feature Marshfield Monument, who was 1895. And they are in the same location, the only business in the same location for all of these years. So we have memorabilia and we tell their story. Next, we give honor to Old City Hall. And we talk about um, how we saved the building from destruction. Um, then we have um, <laughs> some of our stamps saved City Hall. But then um, the desk that, that's on, uh, that you see this on is, um, was donated to us by Marilyn Hardiker. And of course, then that little button was from her being mayor. Now the clock in the background sat on the top floor of Old City Hall for many years and then got put in archives and we took it out of archives. Now we go to um, uh, the Rodis, um, 
um, lumber and veneer. And you'll see a panorama here of the whole exhibit. Now, <clears throat> on the two sides, um, you will see doors. Those doors came out of the Rodas office building. And um, the building is now condemned, but I called them and asked them if they would, um, if we could have some doors. So they graciously hired the Bozen Company to go in. And um, we actually have four doors. And um, we have another one, and then we have a telephone booth um, door also. And so, um, but it tells the story of how successful that um, um, in 1894, that William Henry Rodas came to this um, town to uh, rescue a failing um, business of, of um, uh, Mr. Hatterberg's. And then within four years, he had bought the building, bought the business, and he made it very successful, of course. Now, you will see here a mosquito bomber. Okay, why this mosquito bomber in the Rodas exhibit? Well, the Rodas company made 90% or 60% of the plywood that went into the mosquito bomber in World War II. Now, the mosquito bomber was the fastest bomber in World War II. So we, uh, that was sent to us, that, uh, the bomber itself, um, after the Rodas exhibit at the Henry Ford Museum, they gave it to us. And so you will see the, the map on the bottom. It indicates where the mosquito would, bomber would come and bomb in Germany and then get, and they were able to go back to uh, England because that was a British bomber. And now we have Fred Beal. Fred, Fred Beal was a very unique man. Uh, he was very strong as a child. He, um, but then he grew up and became a wrestler. And um, he held three wrestling championships at the same time. And so the only man to do that. Um, so we tell his story and then on the, the left, the right-hand side, and you can't see it. Um, there's um, you, there we have a, a panorama of him in Denver in a wrestling ring. Now, after Fred Beal uh, retired from wrestling, he became an auxiliary police officer, and so we have the infamous story of how um, in 1933. Um, August, I think it was August 5th, that uh, there was a robbery at the brewery. And um, Fred was on, on call, or he was on, on duty, and he and Officer Friction, Frickson, after they had received a call that um, there was a robbery there from a neighbor, um, they sped in Fred's car, because they didn't have police cars back then, if Fred's in Fred's car. And of course, um, the bottom line is that Fred was shot in the head for five times. And the whole city was very, very, very upset. And so the story, it took actually four years to really catch the perpetrators. And so we have the perpetrators behind bars. Actually, the man on the left died um, but we put him in, in the, because he was one of the perpetrators. Um, he actually died um, after, because he was shot by somebody's bullet here in Marshfield, but he died on the way to Minneapolis. And so we have actually, there's the story, um, we have it in print so that people could, could read it if they'd like, but it's a long story. So, um, and, Fred Beale then became the first and only police officer to, to die in the line of duty. All right, now we go to the Marshfield Clinic. All right, so you see the six founding doctors here, Carl Daigie, William Hipke, Victor Mason, H.H. Millery, and Roy Potter. And um, then we have on the right-hand side, 
you will see a scales there. That was given to us by Dr. Jim Marks. And that story behind that is that Dr. Epstein gave him that um, scales. And so that was actually worked on, that was actually, actually Dr. Epstein's. And I was absolutely thrilled when we got that. And then you will see that there's memorabilia here from the Marshfield Clinic that they have loaned to us. Now we go to the hobo jungle. Why the hobo jungle? Why do we tell this story? Well, would you believe that in 1931, there were 2,863 hobos that went through Marshfield. Now the hobo jungle was located north uh, or north of the Rodas Company and north of the tracks in, in a wooded area. And so that's where the jungles, where they hung out. And um, there is a, an account of what was going on in the jungle at, because some um, one had infiltrated it. And so um, here we depict our, our hobo and um, he's done his wash and he's cooking. He's cooking pork chops and there's um, bacon and eggs. And uh, so anyway, <laughs> we have depicted them, him. Then we also have a collection of Marshfield memorabilia um, that's in the glass case. And here you could we, we focus in on some of those that you can see. Nice collection. Then we go to our infamous iron lung. Now this iron lung is the last one that was in the city of Marshfield. And um, it sat for many years um, in the old brewery. And then when they went to um, tear the brewery down, they called Margaret Peterson and said, Margaret, what should we do with this? So Margaret called Denny Nelson at the Northwood County Historical Society. And, um, and she asked him if they'd like it. And he said, yes. So they moved it there and put it in the corner of the garage. And it stayed there until we found out about it. <laughs> and so we expressed a desire that it would be a great uh, educational tool for our museum. So that weighs 800 pounds and it had to come down 16 steps to the lower level. So um, nobody wanted to tackle the job. And so um, uh, I was telling uh, the story um, to um, Dr. Tom Nikolai at Rotary. And um, I told him, Tom, we can't find anybody to move that because Tom was a, he was an intern at the hospital when they were in where they were working actually during the um, polio period. And so um, he said, hmm, well, let me work on it. So, so he, he got, he went out to Nikolai Construction, bent arms, and would you believe six men brought that down those 18 stairs and it was scary, let me tell you but they, they made it. And so um, Mike Fire, it was all rusty and it was, it was in terrible condition. And so Mike Fire actually has restored it. Beautiful job restoring. And then we have a mannequin inside and then we have a nurse of course there. And we actually um, have um, a testimony from one of the nurses, the last nurse that actually worked on a patient that was in the iron lung. Now we come to the Rodas dress collection, um, the clothing exhibit. Now these are the, the these are, this, this is clothing that was not, um, that not, did not go to, to the Henry Ford Museum. 
um, many, many of the, the uh, dresses, uh, the gowns, went to the Henry Ford Museum. And of course that was on display um, there for a Rodis exhibit. But here you can see some of the lovely gowns that we do have. And here's a crystal vase. Now, um, the gentleman that you saw in the foreground was William, uh, depicted William Henry Rodis. Now this vase, he gave to his wife, Sarah, as a wedding gift. And uh, it sat on Augustus piano, a uh, great baby grand piano in her parlor. Well, one day, one of the women that worked for her dropped it and it cracked. And of course there was fear in the household. But anyway, so um, the family did not know this story. And so um, when they had the sale, they put um, a price on the vase and nobody bought it. So I was at, I was to meet her at the house um, on a Monday morning. And while I was waiting for Sarah to come down, I saw this vase. And I thought, oh, this is a crystal vase. How come? Well, then I saw the crack. Well, so I knew then. So then I went from there because I brought one of the Rodis pianos down to talk to Terry Cole. And Terry Cole told me the story of how come this was so special to Augusta because it was this wedding gift. And he said that when he went to tune the pianos, <clears throat> excuse me, he would never um, touch this bass because, um, because it had the crack. So I went back and I said to Sarah, I want that vase. And so she said, oh, you can have it. So it has been in my possession. So I felt it was indeed appropriate that it come back and be with the Rodis uh, clothing collection. And so see, these are some of the gowns that you see. And this dress here, this gown here, was a, it's called the cocktail dress. And this was one of Augusta's favorite gowns during her college years. So we have that here. All right, now we go to the Adler. Now I have to tell you, uh, the curator for the Rodis dress collection was Edward Mater. And so I worked with Edward for seven years on the Rodis collection. So then when he came in 2018, he fell in love with the Adler project and he said he wanted to do it. So he did research, found what the, um, the, the uh, actually um, Adler um, Opera House looked like inside. And so he has replicated that. And you will see there the screen in the middle, but you'll also see um, on each side comedy and tragedy. So, and Edward has handmade all of this, all of these things except for the faces themselves. And then we have the Adler sign that was um, in, in the new Adler that was built in 1937. Um, this was a replica of the sign outside. And so Mike Fire has again uh, replicated this and it took many, 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 many hours and hard work. And so, and in the background, you can see the reels um, also um, on the wall. And of course, this is a, a mannequin of, of um, JP Adler. And then in the foreground here, you will see an antique um, projector. Now this was actually used in 1907 to show silent movies. And so this was a uh, that Paul Rogers, um, this belonged to Paul Rogers. And so he donated it to the museum. Now here you have um, the bridal gown of Rosa Billy. 
Now, um, it took, um, and again, Edward took many, many, many hours. Well, and actually, of course, Rosa Billy was Betty Adler's uh, grandmother. And so, no mother. Um, and so, Betty one day gave me this wedding gown that was on her garage shelf. And so, Edward has had to spend many hours and because he's a textile conservator. And so um, he took many, many hours restoring this gown. And here you can see the beautiful butterfly in the back of the gown. And here is the front of the gown. We still have to have it um, professionally steamed, but uh, otherwise um, she's complete in a little gazebo that Mike again made. And here is another extension of the uh, bodice um, collection. Uh, we have a, a panorama of the um, bodice house in the background. And then we have a Hamilton and Catherine in her gown. And then we have two children's clothing also. Now here's our agriculture um, exhibit. Um, you see here, and we didn't have as much room as we wanted for agriculture but there was no more room. So there you have the lightning rods that were given to us by, by um, um, Margaret Peterson. And there's two, uh, two actual Didi um, um, balls here that were actually made in Marshfield. Then in the top, you can see on the shelf there, that is a collection of all the figgy barns that were given to us in the figgies. Um, went out of business. Then of course we have in the foreground, we do have some other agricultural things, including some chickens and, and um, things like that. And, and then we also have on the wall, the history of agriculture. Now we go, we have also two um, camera collections, which, is, which are quite valuable. Um, one of them was given to us by the Bogomil family. And another one was given to us by, um, oh, oh dear, <laughs> oh, Gordy Earl. Okay. Now, we also, I did the history of WDLB, then also the faces of WDLB. And the reason for doing that was you always hear the voices of the people uh, behind the, the, uh, the uh, uh, microphone, but you never see their faces. So I have um, um, gone back and um, found um, the histories of these people. And uh, so I have their stories there also. Then of course, when Figgies um, went out of business, they called us, asked us if we'd like some memorabilia and we said, absolutely. And so we have a collection of uh, Figgies um, memorabilia there. Then here we have the history of sports in Marshfield. We, we do baseball, um, we do boxing, we do basketball, um, the, 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 the red and white uniform up there is from one of the um, Sacred Heart, I believe, um, schools because um, basketball was played um, as a sport early on in the history of the, the Catholic schools. And so we have those uniforms. And then you'll see on the shelf, this is a laceless basketball. So there are many made, but, but this was given to us. My, in fact, my son gave us this. And then of course we have this history of football. This is a collection of one of the players from the 1927 team. And then we also have other from the uh, later high school championship football teams also. So this is what we have to show you tonight. Now, there are many, many more wall histories, which we have not shown you. Um, and so you have to come and see it for yourself when we get open. We had a ho hope to be open by this time, but um, we still have a couple exhibits left to finish. And so 
when they are complete. Um, and then we have our punch list to go through. Then um, we'll be ready for the public to come and see us. So I'm ready for any questions that you might have. Shirley, one of the questions that came in right away was, um, what year was the log cabin built? Um, <laughs> there's controversy about that. Either 1872 or 1871. Now I'll tell you the story behind that. Every, every article in any of the papers or, or histories before the 19 or, or, or prior, to about 1935, give 1871 as the date. Everything that was published after that date lists 1872. So um, you can have your choice, <laughs> yes. Do I have any other questions for Shirley? I thoroughly enjoyed all of the stories that you told, and I know some of the backgrounds of some of the stories. Uh, I researched the brewery for someone one time here at the library, and it's it's really a fascinating story. And as you said, it's a very long story to go through the whole it thing. Is. So um, I would recommend people taking the time to learn. Oh, yes, that's an absolutely fascinating story. If you guys want to unmute and go ahead and um, ask a question, or you can put it in the question and answer or in the chat area, and I can um, relay it to Shirley. Well, it was a pleasure being with you this evening. I hope you learned something and will come and see us when we're open. I have, um, Terry said that his, or excuse me, her mother-in-law worked at Rodis during World War II making cloth covers for the airplane wings. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, that's, that's a fascinating story. Um, they worked in the barn. And um, the barn had no heat. And so <laughs> it was cold in the wintertime and hot in the summertime. And the horses were downstairs. And so they worked on, um, they had to iron that the plywood until it was just thin, thin, thin. And then they would um, glue it and put it the other way until they got the strength that they wanted. And they had um, people from the government there uh, to make sure that those um, that those specifications were met completely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. Also, <laughs> um, she also followed up with a. She is nodding her head to this, so she must be listening in as well. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, she is, she says. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I didn't see in there, and maybe it's, it's covered elsewhere, is um, I'm always fascinated by the story of the mayor and the bear. Oh, no, we don't have that. You. We don't have the zoo story. <laughs> Again, there well, was not enough room. <laughs> Yes, uh, the town has so much history and so many interesting stories. Oh, it does. This town is rich in history. And people that say that we don't, you know, don't understand um, how, what wonderful history we do have here in Marshfield, and it does need to be preserved. And that's why we've done what we've done, but we still don't have enough room. <laughs> 
Well, maybe maybe we need to start a fundraiser to get a bigger <laughs> place. Oh, we need a library to give up some of their space so we can move. <laughs> uh, I don't think that'll happen. <laughs> well, I mean, in the basement, in the basement. Oh, in the basement. Yeah, I gotcha. Basement. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I see that we also have people who are looking forward to the museum opening. So right. I wanted okay. to share that with you as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Was there Native American settlement up by Weber's farm is a question that just came in. By Weber's farm? Um, I'm not familiar that it went up that far. Um, I know there was um, a settlement that was by the brewery. And then there was one by um, um, the um, on A Street which would be um, by Arnold Street, where, by where Columbia Park is. Uh -huh. it was a, there was a village there also, and they did have burial grounds. And, and um, we talk about that in the um, New Heritage um, History magazine that has just been published by uh, Hub City Times. Awesome. And, that's, and that's free to the public. Well, as we're gearing up to the 150th anniversary next year, right? Um, I'm sure more and more of these stories will come out, and um, we're looking forward to learning more about our community. Absolutely, absolutely. Anybody have any last questions? Well, I want to thank you, Shirley, for sharing your information with us today. And as always, you have been a, a rock in the community when it comes to the, some of this historical stuff. I have learned so much from you and from Don that I um, can't wait to hear more because I know there's more stories out there. A lots more stories out there. <laughs> lots more. So, well, I want to thank you all for your time today and thank you for attending the program. Um, once again, this has been sponsored by the Everett Rail Marshall Public Library. It has been live streamed and in a few days you should be able to go onto our YouTube channel and be able to watch it over again. So thank you all. Thank you, Lori.